could you tell us a little bit about how spatial reference frames work in haptic perception? In visual perception, obviously, we have our eyes pretty close together, and somewhere in between our eyes, that's probably the egocentric point of uh, how we perceive the world. But how does that work in haptic perception, where we can explore the world with our feet, with our hands? What is the origin of our egocentric reference frame, for example? Well, uh, actually people have tried to do that with haptics in some of the same ways it's been done in vision. For example, setting up beads that go away from the body and asking people to put the beads so that they lie on a straight line and looking at the points of intersection. Another task that's been used is to have people put one finger on the top of a table and then the other finger unseen underneath it and see w how the drift occurs and see whether the er uh, error can be used to interpret the ego center. And one of the things that's found is that, and perhaps this isn't surprising when we think of how many receptors there are all over the body, there is no one single center for egocentric space in haptics. In fact, even touching a tabletop with your right arm, you'll r end up with a slightly different ego center than if you touch with your left arm. And this makes sense when we think about how the brain has to work uh, in order to get us, our limbs, into the right places in space. Uh, we have many joints to move, for example, if we're just trying to reach to a table to pick up uh, an apple or a raisin or something like that. And all of those have to be coordinated. You can think of there being centers in every one of the joints, and those, in fact, must all be put together. So there are many uh, reference frames that are all having to be synchronized at once, and the whole uh, literature on motor control can be thought of as a study of how, in fact, people do manage to coordinate those so that they have very smooth reaching trajectories, they minimize the accelerations and jerks, and that they get to the right place. And um, there are very beautiful models of where that coordination takes place, uh, particularly focusing on the posterior parietal lobe, which we know is spatial attention even for sight. So. In fact, multimodal uh, synchronization of reference frames also comes into play when we act on the world. That, that's an interesting point. So how much of our exploration of the external world through touch will then lead to mental representations or neural representations that are similar to visual explorations of the same environment? So if I explore a space or a spatial layout on a tabletop with my eyes closed, the resulting mental representation that's integrated over time, over all of these hand movements, does that have a visual characteristic? Or does vision and, and, and uh, haptic exploration lead to the same kind of amodal representation that's neither spatial, neither visual nor haptic? Well, I certainly am a pro proponent of amodal representations. And I think, indeed, that uh, vision and haptics do meet. Uh, both on the scale of moving your whole body and on the scale of exploring locations in space. If I explore on the tabletop, there are many illusions that have been documented. For example, the same distance explored by pushing away from me is going to feel slightly different from exactly equivalent distance that's done by scanning my hand this way. Vision is not going to make those same errors. And in fact, if vision is present, it will probably dominate and we won't make those errors at all, even though we explore by seeing and, and touching. So when multiple senses congregate, they do contribute to a representation of space, not necessarily equally. And then, I, yes, I do believe that that representation of space can, in fact, guide us even when we take one of the source senses away. So when we look at the tabletop, we can reach to points on it through touch, even without visual guidance, after we've closed our eyes which means there's a transference of the spatial representation that we formed from vision that's accessible now to touch. And uh, vice versa, if I were to touch the world and then you were to say to me, all right, when you open your eyes, look immediately at the point where the beanbag was, I could do that. And so this crosstalk certainly says the modalities interact. But beyond that, I think there are spatial representations that, in fact, uh, are converged upon that are appropriately called amodal because they don't belong to any one sense. Now, this reminds me a little bit. You brought up the, the, the issue of um, vision sometimes overriding our haptic perception, that vision might be dominant in some tasks. 
Um, and some people have developed what they call sticky icons, for example, on a computer screen, where if you move your mouse over the desktop and there's, a, there's an icon and you hit the icon, all of a sudden the cursor moves much slower. And then it moves faster again after you've passed it. And this actually creates, in some people, a haptic illusion that you actually get stuck there and that it's harder to move the cursor away from there. So it's, uh, it's, again, integrates vision and haptics to some degree. I think that's a, a perfectly lovely uh, demonstration. And of course, there are many others, like the ventriloquism effect, which, in which we attach uh, sound to a spatial origin because we see someone's lips moving. Uh, these kinds of intersensory interactions are very common, often very elegant and show us that the brain is trying to achieve a resolution of a coherent world, not one in which we have a cacophony of independent senses that are screaming different things at us. So sometimes, depending on the task, vision will dominate, and then some others, haptic perception actually will take over and be more important. Like if your visual resolution isn't great or if you're occluding something and you don't really have visual input, then haptics will take over. Yes, there's a wonderful model for this that was developed several years ago by Martin Banks and, and uh, Mark Ernst. Called, and they used what is a, a statistical model called maximum likelihood uh, model. And the novelty of their approach was to show that people are actually very good at using this model when they put different modal modality inputs together. And the way it works is it says, OK, we have inputs from two senses, and how do we value each one? And what the model says is, on the fly, we get an impression of how reliable each of the senses is under these circumstances of illumination or wearing gloves or whatever it may be. And then we attach weights to them that are inversely related to their, um, uh, their uh, variance, so that the more reliable they are, the more we weight them. And I think that's a very nice general purpose model that the brain seems to latch on to a lot of the time. So. I don't believe that vision always captures touch. Indeed, I think touch can capture vision. It just depends on how the senses are being used for the particular task at hand.